Our speaker today is indeed Michael Bradford. He had a near-death experience at age three, and I'm pretty sure that contributed greatly to the development of his psychic abilities. And Michael thinks big. Prior to entry into his present incarnation, he agreed to take on four lifetimes of karma, all in this one lifetime. Hey, get her done. <laughs> Michael has studied extensively in 55 different countries with uh, shamans, healers, medicine people of all kinds, psychics, mystics, including Native Americans, the Native Can Canadian First Nation people, the Inuit of the far north, Peruvian shamans, the psychic healers uh, and surgeons of the Philippines, and the Maori natives of New Zealand. <clears throat> and Michael, I'll, I'll warn you, he likes to get straight to the point of things. Some religious traditions have elaborate prayers and rituals in conjunction with their healing techniques. Michael has a prayer too. Goes like this, let's do it. <laughs> so since Michael is his own best publicist, Please welcome our friend, our brother, our teacher, Michael Bradford. Can I hire you as my publicist? <laughs> um, this is probably going to be the hardest talk that I've ever given in my life. And I've given talks to many people in many countries. The largest group I've spoken to is over a thousand people. However, this I know is a, a talk that I'm giving in a way at great risk to myself. So I come before you in great humility. I am a storyteller, among other things. I've been called many names in my life, one of them being storyteller. I am a truth speaker. If you do not want to know the truth, do not hang around with me. I do not work through the layers of the onion. I go directly to the core. My purpose is not to harm, not to hurt, but to serve. You have the right to take as long as you want to heal, to transform, and to change. However, you also have the right in one instant to shift. It is your choice. I'm going to talk to you about five or six different people today who I have met personally. The first one is Merlin the Magician. I was giving talks and living in the UK at that time. And I was in Scotland. And I was doing some talks and workshops in Aberdeen. And I get a phone call. Michael, my daughter's been everywhere. No one's been able to help her. She's suffering. I do not have the skills to help her. I understand you're pretty good. I went, yeah, not bad. And he kept talking to me, begging me to let his daughter attend the workshop. Again, I was in near Aberdeen in Scotland. He was down in the London area. And I told him, I said, you know, most people, if they don't have skin in the game, if they don't have an investment, they don't get better. And he said, Michael, I have nothing. I've lost everything. I'm living in my car. I beg you, please let my daughter attend. And I said, I'll think about it. Give me a call next week. And I hung up. Next week, he calls me up and he says, Michael, have you made a decision? I said, yes. Your daughter can come in one condition, one condition only. He said, Michael, anything, thank you, thank you, thank you. What's your condition? I said, you get your butt up here too. And he said, Michael, I can't. I have nothing. I'm living in my car. I have no money for gas. I have nothing. I said, then your daughter cannot come. And I hung up on him. The day of the workshop, he shows up with his daughter. And the way I work in a workshop is I have a circle of 22 people, roughly. 
I have no agenda in my workshop. Who wants to work? Who wants to clear? Who wants to heal? And I would go around working with people. The first day of my workshop is a normal, if there is a normal Michael Bradford workshop, okay? Second day, around 10 o'clock in the morning, I look over and I go, oh my God, the man who called me asking about his daughter was Merlin the magician in this lifetime. Tears are flooding down my face. I walk over. I'm sitting on the ground holding Merlin's hand. And I said, beloved Merlin, you cursed your own soul. You wanted to rid the planet of evil. And you were stopped by spirit. But you judged yourself and you cursed your own soul. Earth is a planet of polarities, good, bad, right, wrong, black, white, male, female. Earth is about polarities. And if Merlin had to rid the planet of evil, Earth would have had to been destroyed as a schoolhouse. Beloved Merlin was an architect who designed, in this lifetime, healing centers, gorgeous, beautiful, but he wound up in one lawsuit after another lawsuit after another because he cursed his own soul. He had a vision. He wanted to rid the planet of evil. Worthy cause, but he didn't see the bigger picture. I'm asking you, please see the bigger picture. Understand what your soul came in to do. Understand what is being asked of you. You can lead people to the promised land. You cannot make them enter it. And if you push them, if you shove them, if you drag them, you are violating their soul. I've never heard from Merlin again after that meeting, but I have tears in my eyes and my heart honors and hurts for Merlin because he had what he saw as a worthy cause. The next person I want to talk about is Job. And a lot of people have turned to me and said, Michael, your life story sounds like Job's. You started your book publishing, book distribution company to help people in the spiritual field. And the market turned and you lost everything. Michael, you got into the oil business as a consultant. The, the partner died and you they asked you to take over as president of the company and you did. And everything was blowing and going and the government changed the rules and you lost everything. I could keep on going. However, friends of mine have said, Michael, and this happened twice in the last six months, three months. Michael, you are being tested and tested and tested. When I lost my oil company, oil drilling and exploration company, and we were on the verge of being one of the richest people on the planet. And by the way, my only goal was not to have a Learjet not to have a Mercedes, not to have a Ferrari. My, what I wanted was to build the healing centers all over the world, the new ones that took the people on the cutting edge of the cutting edge of the cutting edge. And my cousin Stanley, bless his soul, he's on the other side now, probably, probably listening. And my cousin Stanley turned to me and said, Michael, how can you believe in spirit after all the hell you've been through in your life? And I looked at him, I said, I never thought of not trusting spirit. I never thought of not trusting my intuition. Job, there's a book that someone sent me, and it's about the Jungian perception of the book of Job. And what it talks about how Job actually taught God about commitment, taught God about passion, about service, about surrender, about commitment. 
we're all being tested. And in reality, we're all testing ourselves. When people looked at my astrology chart, they said, Michael, you're insane. I said, yeah, I know that. You didn't tell me anything I didn't know. My whole chart is scrunched. It's like the 11th, 12th, uh, 10th, 11th, 12th, maybe lit on the first house. I've got a whole bunch of things empty. My whole astrology chart is serve or suffer. And I set it up, okay? I want to talk to you about the next person, King David. There's a lot of people in this lifetime that turn around and call me David. And in, in the beginning, I kind of laughed. And then the pieces started coming together. And I believe I was part of the soul of King David. And I've carried a lot of guilt, a lot of shame for the things that, quote, I did, didn't turn out right, didn't turn out the way I expected it to. And Judith Stevens over at the Edgar Cayce Institute, who runs the um, Search for God programs, out of nowhere, without even talking about King David twice, she came up and said, King David made every mistake in the book, but he only made it once. And then he learned, and he didn't make it again. Well, I've made my mistakes more than once. And the point is, we are all learning. We are all works in progress. Perfection does not exist. No, I'm sorry. My father told me I was perfect over and over and over again. I forgot. My father told me I was perfect. He said, Michael, you are perfectly impossible. <laughs> but that's another story. King David lived his life fully. King David went for it. And a lot of times he did it wrong. We learn as we go. Hopefully we gain from one lifetime to another. Hopefully we gain in this lifetime. Another one I want to talk, person I want to talk to you about is Alexander the Great. I spent quite a bit of time, about a year in Greece, teaching, studying, traveling to the different places, different sacred healing sites. And I've been told that I am part of Alexander the Great's soul, or I was Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great, he's known, he's known for being a brilliant warrior a brilliant leader, a brilliant general. But you know something? His goal was not to kill. His goal was not to destroy. I'm here to tell you what the truth is. The truth is that he wanted to build an alliance where there was no war, where people were trading and helping each other. Alexander the Great did not destroy any culture. He didn't even kill the leaders. If they were willing to negotiate and make peace, he honored them, kept them in power, and brought them into a trading organization that was global. There wouldn't have been a Russia, there wouldn't have been a China, there wouldn't have been North Korea if Alexander the Great had his way, because they would have been helping and supporting each other. Alexander the Great did not want blood. He wanted peace. He wanted alliances. He honored every religion that he came in contact with. He honored every culture and every custom he came in contact with. We will leave now honoring Alexander. 
and ask how many of us have the courage. Alexander the, the Great didn't give up. He kept moving and moving and moving, and he died at around age 33. I want to talk to you about Archimedes. Archimedes is a great teacher of mine. I don't know what my connection is with Archimedes, but I know something. Archimedes was taking a bath. And when he got into the bathtub, water splurged out from the sides. And he realized, wow, the water that is displaced is the exact same volume as my physical body. Hello? Okay, how does that relate to me and what I do? If you are not present and taking responsibility for being in your physical body, then what is there? Entities, curses, spells, implants, black magic, voodoo, sorcery, that's what's there. And if you are present fully in your physical body, in your energy body, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and energetically, guess what? Nothing can get to you, distract you, or scramble you. So Archimedes is a great teacher for me. If you're not in your body, here's your physical body, here's your energy body. If you're not there, and you don't take responsibility for your own energy, guess what? You got critters in your energy field. You're ungrounded. You're not connected to spirit. Or should I say you run the danger of? I apologize for that. Whenever I look at a person, I remember Archimedes. And my first job, my only job, my main job in doing healing, doing coaching, doing counseling, helping people, is having the courage to take responsibility and live in your body. When I was working with the Maoris in New Zealand, we did ceremonies. You know what they said? Forget about that. Forget about nirvana. Forget about going up there. You were incarnated to get in your physical body. You were incarnated to learn how to be human. You already are spiritual. Get in your body. Live there. That's the gift you were given. And if you don't do it in this lifetime, you get a chance to come back and do it next lifetime, and the time after, and the time after. Archimedes, thank you. The last one I'm going to talk about is Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, my father. When I was living in London, and I mentioned already that I spent quite a bit of time living over in Europe and all over this world. I've lived quite a few different places. I was living in London at the time. And every time it came close to my birthday, a couple of months before, I had this incredible pull. Remember, I'd lived in Greece. I've traveled throughout Greece. I've had many experiences in Greece. But all, I had not been to the island of Kos, where Hippocrates has his healing center. I'd been to other ones. I kept having this pull, go there. And I kept saying, it's far, it's going to cost a lot of money, I don't know anyone. Nah. Two years in a row, I had conscious awareness, a pull, to go to the island of Kos. And I didn't listen. Well. When you don't listen, spirit hits you with a two by four or a lightning rod or a lightning bolt, excuse me. So again, it comes time for my birthday. I get a phone call from one of my friends in New Zealand saying, Michael, I'm going to the island of coast with my girlfriend. Why don't you meet me there? I went three times. I surrender. I flew to the island of coast a week before my friend got there. Rented a car, rented a hotel room, stayed on the island, 
and a couple of days later went to the Asclepios, which is the healing center of Hippocrates. And for the first time in my life, I felt nothing, zero, zilch, nada. Almost unheard of for me. So I go and I find a place on the beach that's very isolated, and I stayed on the beach for three days, four days. I didn't even stay in a hotel room. My friend flies in with his girlfriend. He's very psychic and intuitive. And we go touring the island. He said, Michael, let's go to the healing center. And he didn't feel anything. And his girlfriend, who was psychic, didn't feel anything. And we're there scratching our heads. And he said, Michael, let's take a walk up in the hills behind the center. So we did. And we came to an, a, the foundation of what looked like a small temple or shrine. And it was about six feet, two meters wide. And it was about four meters, 12 feet long. And it was just marble, but it was the ruins. It, there wasn't anything high. There wasn't anything you could tell. And there was also a log that was a tree that had fallen. And my friend said, Michael, why don't we sit down? And Michael, why don't you lead a meditation? I said, OK. I said, sounds good. We sat down. I'm sitting on the log. My friend and his girlfriend are sitting there, and I start the meditation, and the energy of Hippocrates comes towards me, not visibly, but I sensed it, and it was Hippocrates, Hippocrates asking for forgiveness. And I looked and I said, you're asking me for forgiveness? Sure, no problem. And then everything faded away. I went back with my friends to tour the island. And I get back to London, and I get on the phone to all my psychic friends. I said, what the heck mm -mm 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 just happened? And this is what they told me. They said, Michael, you were the illegitimate son of Hippocrates. He refused to acknowledge that you were his child. And he refused to teach you. And not only did Hippocrates ask for forgiveness, but I have a very strong feeling that Hippocrates has come into my energy field to be one of my guides this lifetime. I was also told by the psychics that Hippocrates did not get it all. He got a good portion of it, but he missed some areas. And he said, Michael, you have the opportunity in this lifetime to complete Hippocrates, Hippocrates' work. I say this in all humility. We are all channels. We are all vehicles of expression that spirit works through. And the question is, do we say yes or do we say no? Do we say, yes, I accept the highest and I will only work with those beings on the master level of the white light or higher? I have been offered incredible power and many other things. It's like, nope. I'll only work with those on the master level of the white light or higher or with their permission and approval. It is with great honor that I met Merlin. And someone said, Michael, you knew Merlin when he was alive. That's the only reason you could pick it up. And I don't know. I just know of the experience and of Job. And Job was actually a teacher of God because God kept testing Job and Job kept on sticking with it. 
Alexander the Great wanted to honor all traditions, all cultures, all people, all colors, all races. There was no prejudice with Alexander the Great. Archimedes teaching us to stay in our body, to take responsibility for the physical vehicle that we have. Hippocrates, all these people were not perfect. They all were human, they all made mistakes. There were things that they could have done better. There are things we can do better. We are humans. That's why they put erasers on pencils, or at least they used to. We are humans. We fall flat on our face sometimes. And sometimes that's when we learn the most. That's when we gain the most, is when we fail the biggest. Or it may look like a failure. It's only a learning lesson. I want to thank you for listening. And now I'm going to lead you in a meditation to anchor in the wisdom. So just allow yourself now to relax. You can close your eyes and just feel yourself letting go. Letting go and drifting down. Drifting down and letting go. And I'd like you just to acknowledge yourself for all the tests, all the trials. Acknowledge yourself for having the courage to come to earth. Acknowledge yourself for breathing. Acknowledge yourself for all the risks that you've taken, regardless of the outcome. Honor yourself for who you are, who you really are. And just allow yourself now to Invite spirit and healing energy to wash over you. To cleanse you on all levels throughout all dimensions. Take in a deep breath and breathe in love, self-compassion, forgiveness. You can be the most loving human being on the planet, the most forgiving person on the planet. However, most people, especially spiritual people, forget to love themselves. So it's time to remember that you're a human and to have the utmost of love and compassion for yourself. And as you fill yourself with unconditional love, as you fill yourself with compassion, you may just notice that your body is healing. Your body, your mind, your spirit is healing. It is time, dear ones, it is time, beloved ones, to fill yourself with white light and to claim the awesomeness that is already within you. And I ask God, Holy Spirit, should you wish 
to review your guides and teachers and help you. To bring in, to connect you with the best and highest spiritual guides, teachers, and helpers. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Today is a gift. However, will you please remember that you are the gift. Who you are is the gift. And just take a moment and bring in even more white light, bring in more healing energy. And just know that this energy is available to you at any time, all the time. And that God, Holy Spirit, your guides and teachers are always there. The energy in this room is very high. Miracles can happen. It's all up to you. And all you have to do is say yes. That's all you have to do. It's free. And in a moment, not now, but in a moment, we're going to take you back, bring you back to the level of conscious awareness. And the healing will continue should you want it. And now gently feel yourself coming back into your physical body. Feel yourself coming back, coming back. And slowly and gently feel yourself coming back into your physical body, grounding and connecting to yourself. And when you're ready, just allow your eyes to open gently. Coming back, coming fully back into your physical body. We'll take a moment as everybody comes back. I know that energy out there is so luscious, so delicious, that the temptation is to stay there. But we need to come back for now. Coming back. There's still a few people that are out there. Come on back. Good. I want to thank you for inviting me today. Um, I just wanted to share that I am local and that there are some of my books on the table for sale and there's also a mailing list if you want to stay in touch. So I want to thank you again for inviting me. I want to thank you for listening and allowing me to be part of this group. Namaste.